Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Celine Pizer, the Intercept Senior Director of Philanthropic Partnerships. I'm very honored to welcome members of our board along with our readers and supporters to today's conversation, which we will be recording. You're joining us in an exciting moment for the Intercept where we have an opportunity to have greater impact and reach. And we can't do it without our community of loyal supporters and friends. Thank you for being with us today. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from our politics team. Before I turn it over to them, I want to share just a bit about the Intercept's election reporting. As we gear up for the 2024 presidential election, it's more important than ever to have a reliable source of news and analysis. The Intercept has been at the forefront of political journalism since its inception, and our coverage of the 2024 election will be no exception. Democracy is on the ballot, and we are committed to providing our readers with the most accurate and up-to-date information on the candidates, their policies, and the issues that matter most to our readers. But we can't do it alone. The Intercept was founded to tell courageous stories that are missing from the mainstream media, and we're proud to be powered by donations from the public. We need your support to continue our coverage and ensure that we can provide the kind of in-depth reporting that our readers have come to expect from us. Thank you to those who have already given their support. You can make a donation by visiting theintercept.com slash election24. The link is in the chat. And with that, I'm honored to introduce Ryan Grimm, Ken Klippenstein, and Prem Tucker. Thanks, Celine, and thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, Prem. Thank you, Ken. Uh, caucuses, great time. As Trump said, everybody had a great time. Uh, he he th he thanked uh, Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley for enjoying themselves as much as they did. And I think what he was trying to signal right there is that okay, look, this was all fun and games. It's over. Like enough, en enough with you know trying to compete in these elections. It's clear uh, that that I'm going to romp. Uh, probably the best of all worlds for for Donald Trump because Nikki Haley, who is his biggest threat uh, in New Hampshire, which is, appears to be almost the only state that anybody is a threat to him anywhere in the country, uh, uh, finished third place. And so that hurts her heading into New Hampshire. Uh, DeSantis ha doesn't have a path that I can see to um, any other, uh, any victory in any state. Uh, Trump is polling something like 30 points ahead of Nikki Haley in her own state of South Carolina, which will be right after New Hampshire, and then just before Super Tuesday, where he is again polling massively ahead of everybody else in, in the field. Obviously, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, who people were, you know, his his people were hoping he was going to shock the world. He, the pollsters were right; they were right about pretty much everybody. Um, and so, uh, you guys can get a lot of the horse race coverage. I think. Uh, pretty much anywhere anywhere else in the land uh in the uh, like media ecosystem here i wanted to talk a little bit first about one one or two points and then we have a bunch of questions from you guys that we want to get to so i want to go to those quickly so that we have time to get through as many of them as we can but um prem or, and ken um maybe maybe prem you could take this one first um what i i thought it was i thought it was interesting that trump in his victory speech last night mentioned all of the death and destruction as he called it around the world you have a very very clear allusion um to both the war in ukraine and also uh the, the ongoing israeli uh war against gaza and he said he's going to make that a big part of his campaign uh he has been conspicuously silent uh when it comes to the question of israel palestine um, for the most part, since uh, since October seventh, uh, it, it's and so, Prem, give me your give me your kind of strategic thinking um, on why he's been so silent on that issue, and what do you think he means when he says he's going to make all of the death and destruction a major theme of his upcoming campaign? It's fascinating because. Obviously, with the party writ large, it's obviously quite pro-Israel. They have no qualms with, uh, you know, allying to that fact. Um, of course, he himself was a very pro-Israel as president, moving the embassy and so on. Um, I think one aspect of this could be is just that 
for many people in the party, obviously, this is a huge turnoff um, for part of the base for, for the Democrats um, and how Biden's handling this. Um, but it's also an interesting sort of uh, rift point for many people who aren't necessarily Democratic, who might be kind of idiosyncratic in their ways of looking at the world, who might be anti-war, but might not be necessarily Democratic on other issues, but can kind of swing either way. And so for a lot of those people, I think perhaps the illusion that, you know, under Trump, there was none of this violence, none of this destruction, um, for him to kind of allude at that again, and for that to be sort of a, a big part of his campaign to put an end to it, I think could be part of it. Um, it is interesting, as you see, how conspicuous, conspicuously silent he's been on it. Um, because again, like, oh, go ahead. No, yeah, yeah, I can. I want to get your take on that too, because it, it's it's quite clear that you know Netanyahu would love nothing more than to see Biden defeated. You know, he's he wanted to see Obama defeated. He, he, I'm sure he'd be happy to see Biden go down and see Trump back in the White House. But sometimes I wonder if Netanyahu should be careful what he wishes for, because you know Biden is taking huge political damage in order to stand by uh, Netanyahu. Trump is not the kind of politician that is going to take political heat for anybody. Like he is just the most uber cynical politician who has ever walked on the stage. The second that anything is causing him even like not advantage, let alone disadvantage, he's going to cut him loose. So to me, I think Netanyahu ought to be a little bit careful what he's wishing for here. It, what did you? What are you reading between the the lines of his conspicuous silence when it comes to this issue, and then also his his bringing it up uh, obliquely in his in his speech last night? Yeah, well, I think a point here that the mainstream has kind of missed that I find very interesting has been Donald Trump's messaging around Netanyahu. He's actually criticized him, uh, not with respect to the mm -hmm. Palestinians and their rights, um, but uh, a couple of weeks ago he put out a statement saying that um, Netanyahu wanted wanted him to bomb Iran and describing that as a crazy recommendation, which is far beyond anything uh, Biden, his MO, which is to kind of back channel and communicate internally uh, cr critiques. I mean, you know, he's he's betting on a uh, wild card here that I think you're you're quite right to, to, you know, look at Trump and see the exact opposite of Biden in terms of not being institutionalist at all and being willing to, um, you know, uh, uh, not just say these things, but I mean, in the context of a party where, um, you know, there's overwhelming support for Israel, the fact that Trump will go and basically say, you know, Netanyahu is not very bright. He told me to bomb Iran. I didn't do it because I'm smarter than he is. It's just like, yeah, I mean, I, and that's kind of the point of 2024. And something that we want to drive that I would like to drive home is like how much the the um, staid ways of understanding how these institutions work just go out the window with someone like Donald Trump. You can't really rely on, oh, historically, this is always how it goes. I mean, the guy you can't, you know, you can't really predict what he's gonna, what he's gonna do, and that's kind of how I would characterize. I mean, I have people ask me, you know, what do you think is gonna happen with the Middle East? I don't think anybody knows. I mean, you look at a lot of the um, discord that we're seeing right now. The seeds of, of these things, um, you know, in a lot of ways were planted, you know, 50 years ago, um, but but um, in in key ways too were planted during the Bi during the Trump administration, which uh, I was fortunate enough to be here to report on and describe. Uh, you know, the Department of Homeland Security put out intelligence reports warning that there would be consequences, there's gonna be an arrest if they, for example, move the embassy to Jerusalem, if they, for example, um, uh, cut funding to the um, Palestinian Authority, if they nor try to normalize relations between Israel and these Gulf states, we're now reaping the consequences of, and I don't wanna say, you know, Trump caused all of it, because that's not true. Um, but in key ways, when, when you know, <laughs> we were trying to raise, the, raise, raise concerns about these things, when people were like, ah, what? there was a time period for about a year or so after Trump, uh, uh, did his Abram, of course, where people are like, remember when these, you know, uh, voices were criticizing it, saying there were going to be consequences? So much for that. Right? Wasn't right. that foolish of them? And it's right. like, it, well, la it lasted three days without without blowing the entire region up. So it, <laughs> it it must be fine. And yeah, and I and I bring I bring this up because I think our our one one of our major roles that we play in the media ecosystem is to not let foreign policy, uh, imperialism, anti imperialism. Um, get pushed aside for just pure horse race coverage. Uh, and there's there's an interesting question in here that we can weave in while, while sticking with Iowa and, and on our route to um, New Hampshire. And either one of you guys uh, take this one. But uh, this is from uh, Stefan Levy uh, in New York, um, who asked, uh, do you expect Nikki Haley to flip-flop on support for Ukraine 
to keep the Republican base. Either of you want to take that first? I just talked. Prem, why don't you take this one? I don't necessarily anticipate, at least in the short term, insofar as I think she's leaned more into compromising herself, you know, more to the right on cultural grounds, but seems slightly less so to do, or slightly less likely to do so on policy issues like Ukraine and abortion. And some of that does seem, of course, like genuinely ideological, but, you know, doing so, what, like, allowing herself to compromise on those grounds and avoiding criticizing Trump too much, um, and all of a sudden getting wrapped into this question about slavery, it, I think weirdly allows her to tread water as far as the, the right side of the party goes. And I think she's just kind of hoping she outlasts DeSantis enough such that, you know, then of course it's just a her versus Trump race. And of course that's the second challenge of, of being ho hoping that Trump tanks or faces legal consequences. Um, so it's a double-legged challenge that she's facing at least in the near term. But I think that sort of rationale explains her logic and not flip-flopping insofar as it's not necessary for her to flip on Ukraine to maintain her sort of 15 to 25 percent of support that she's latching onto. As far as the medium to long term, I'm not sure. I think if it's, again, her versus Trump, I think it'll be Trump unless something happens that forces him out. So I think I don't anticipate at least in the near term, but that's my yeah. read. Right. And and Ukraine uh, does seem like and, you know, U.S. support for Ukraine does seem like one of those positions where she is just kind of ideologically committed, like the either because that's where her base of support is from or just her own kind of ideology uh, fits in with that. Uh, Vivek did, I think, effectively just annihilate her in, in the uh, presidential debate when he asked her to name you know, four provinces in uh, eastern Ukraine uh, that she wanted to send you know, US, U.S. support to defend. That was, that was pretty embarrassing, like, especially if you're the if you've made this a big part of your campaign and you used to be at the UN, you know, you should be able to come, you should be able to come up with those. Um, and, which brings me to the question and Ken, I'm curious for your take on this. You have this kind of move among some Democrats in New Hampshire to say Nikki Haley is preferable to Donald Trump uh, because Donald Trump is a kind of a unique threat to democracy. And if we get, can get Nikki Haley in, uh, that's only, you know, she's bad, but at least, you know, that that preserves uh, democracy. Then you have other Democrats who will, say, who will say, no, actually, all of them are a threat to democracy. Uh, J.B. Pritzker, I think, said, you know, you either get the, you know, the kind of quiet part out loud uh, guy with Donald Trump or you get the, the other ones who are just kind of be more, more subtle about it. But they're all, you know, authoritarians and autocrats under, underneath it. But to me. When you, particularly when you look at Nikki Haley's foreign policy views and her approach to um, U.S. power abroad, she seems to me actually substantially worse than Trump, um, despite how Trump is a unique threat and danger in his own right in a number of other ways. I'm curious for your take on that as somebody who talks to a lot of people in the national security and foreign policy world. Yeah, this kind of goes back to my point about the um, Israel uh, Middle East normalization, um, the Abram, the so called the Abram Accords. Looking at that in the short term, you could have looked at it and said, well, look, there's no consequences. What's the big deal? Why is everyone whining? But in the long term, it always looks very different. And in that same respect, someone like Haley, um, you know, isn't threatening to, uh, you know, consolidate power in her first day in office like Trump is. That's true. But people like Nikki Haley for decades led to someone like Donald Trump. So if you zoom out in a long enough term, you're not really solving anything if you're returning to the same conditions that uh, lead to the whatever the frustration is that 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 um, results in someone like Trump. So so I, I want to make that broader point. Um, but then to your question of um, national uh, security, I'm reading uh, John Bolton's memoir right now, a room, the room where it happened. And, um, you know, the the kind of through line of the book, his shtick is kind of like, you know, I was one of the adults in the room that was keeping Trump from doing all kind of horrible things. Um, which, to be sure, there are horrible things that uh, Trump wanted to do. But when you look at what it was that um, uh, John Bolton and um, uh, James Mattis and some of these other principal national security figures were doing, it was hair raising. I'll give you an yes. example. But Bolton is trying. Bolton favors a uh, preemptive strike on North Korea, which has thermonuclear weapons, thousands of times more powerful than the ordinary nuclear uh, warheads that that um, you know we think we typically think of. Um, you know, if Bolton had gotten what he wanted, I can't even imagine what something like that. Would look like, and Haley comes out of the exact same 
kind of like foreign policy right wing think tank um, apparatus that he did. And so I think this nuance is kind of lost, particularly in in more partisan quarters in coverage where it's kind of like, okay, Trump bad, therefore whoever's against him must be good. It's kind of much more uh, complicated than that, you know. And in fact, when reading through Bolton's memoir, not only uh, does Trump have bad ideas, occasionally have an idea that I thought wasn't so bad, like, uh, you know, pulling U.S. troops from Syria, which again, we're seeing now they're getting struck. Uh, these are sitting ducks to that, that risk them getting hurt and drawing us into conflict. I didn't think that was a bad idea, um, but uh, Mattis slow walked it and so did other administration officials. So really, you've got a viper's nest here of people that are bad in different ways that, that I think um, it doesn't do the public any favors to just kind of flatten this into, you know, Trump versus how do we stop Trump sort of thing. Yeah, and Prem, I'm curious for your take on that because I'm glad you mentioned uh, Bolton because just this morning um, I interviewed the uh, former uh, foreign minister of Ecuador, uh, uh, Guillaume Long. So that'll be an upcoming uh, deconstructed episode, and you know he he talked about the way that the Trump administration really enabled the you know basically an austerity and an authoritarian takeover in Ecuador and you know late late. In the, in the early part of his administration and all the way through it, ho- basically completely hollowed out the, the state capacity of Ecuador. Uh, and now the narco traffickers are just legitimately like just straight up contesting for actual state power. Like the, it's, it's headed towards a narco state. It's like one of the most, uh, you know, stunning kind of rebukes of austerity and neoliberalism um, in, in such a rapid amount of time that you Kind of ever seen and people like bolton were, were driving this and so on the one hand you have nikki haley being ideologically aligned with somebody like bolton and worse than trump when it comes to this question on the other hand trump enabled these people hired bolton brought him into his administration and took the reins off of them and when he wanted to get something done like get troops out of syria he was unable to do it and so prem does it does it really even matter what trump's preferences are when it comes to U.S. foreign policy if he's just going to surround himself with uh, a bunch of Nikki Haley's and also Nikki Haley herself. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point in, like, in recalling what happened when he won the first time, as in you need to staff a government, you need to staff um, your, you know, your regime. And the fact of the matter is, at least at that point, and I think likely at this point too, there's not enough Vivek Ramaswamy's running around to just man every post that he wants to that have relevant experience for each thing. Um, and, you know, there I believe there's one question about Project 2025, for instance. Yeah, you, want, you want to just take that one now? That's from, yeah. let, let's give give props to whoever it's from, assuming they wanted their name used. Yes, John Frazier uh, from New York asked, what is Project 2025? Um, so yeah. talk about that. Yeah, so there's this big project that's been led by a, a bunch of conservative groups, um, many of which, of course, are connected to Leonard Leo. Um, the Heritage Foundation is uh, spearheading this project. And basically, it's it's a, an ambition to have a mass scale overhaul and, and, and immersion of practically every federal agency. It involves ridding the government of the DOJ, the FBI, the DHS, or at least whittling a lot of them down. And instead, bringing thousands of, of conservative patriots to D.C. to essentially replace the deep state and essentially take whatever jobs are remaining. And of course, you know, it's it's something that Ramaswamy spearheaded more than other candidates. But I'll, I'll, you saw a lot of those elements in, in some of the other candidates as well. And, you know, t- to the previous point, of course, one challenge of that is just having enough people to staff this this dream. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we have seen minor mirrors of this threat already um, in, in different states, one of which just sort of the basic anti-government stances and just um, um, obstructiveness of Wisconsin Republicans against um, Governor Tony Evers um, to, to Florida, where, of course, you know, DeSantis has has taken many liberties to directly attack education, to foment, foment a, a pressure against public education, to single-handedly just staff different, you know, college boards with hand-picked appointees, um, and of course, that's a, a micro example, but those tendencies are there. And, you know, we sometimes wonder the extents of the appropriateness of using the the D dictator word on Trump. But on the other hand, he's shown the proclivity before in certain respects. He's inspired that tendency throughout the country um, with all of these different state lawmakers. And for better, or for worse, as we've kind of alluded to already, he's shown that he's not necessarily bound by 
ideology or even political logic sometimes. Um, so with that in mind, I do think broadly, it, it is fair to worry about efforts like Project 2025, if nothing else, just because there's millions of, of dollars behind it and because the potential forebears of it don't really have you know, any bounds. Um, and Ken, let's let's do this one. This is another foreign policy question. Um, what's what's your view of the gro this is uh, this one's uh, the person wanted to remain, remain anonymous. What's your view of the growing concern that younger Democratic voters are so disenchanted with Biden that they'll sit out the presidential election? Could that potentially throw the election to Trump? Well, I try to avoid prognostications because the world is so complicated. There's so many factors. If we learned anything from 2020, it's that a crazy pandemic can happen and completely scramble the deck. Um, so, you know, I'm hesitant. I'm reluctant always to make any sort of predictions. Uh, but I will say this. Um, from the start, uh, there were progressive commentators saying, you know, this could hurt Biden in Michigan. This could hurt Biden with the youth. And from the very beginning of the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict, uh, there were people that were bitterly uh, uh, critical of that view and said that this is wildly overstating it. And uh, the data, at least at this point in time, at this snapshot in time, is bearing that out to a substantial degree. Um, if that will have staying power and um, uh, continue through to you know, the election in November is a separate question. But the data we have so far shows that, yes, it has uh, dented his support and it uh, poses a uh, substantive problem. And I think that the fact that people uh, poo pooed that and treated it as ridiculous from the beginning, um, you know, I was in, I had a kind of wait and see attitude because everything that was happening was so extraordinary and un unprecedented, at least in, in, in recent, at least in recent history. Uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, that says to me, it's like, well, you know, maybe we should hold off on, on these uh, proclamations of, you know, how, how things are going to uh, play out in such an, un like, again, unusual election between um, two candidates, which, you know, let's, uh, be real, both faced very steep um, negatives uh, from both of their own parties. Um, the majority of uh, Biden's own party didn't want him to run again, citing age concerns. In Trump's case, there's the mountain of indictments. So this is a really unusual election. I think when you look at political science, just not to get too philosophical, but it's based on the social science of um, uh, uh, structuring, establishing a baseline around what has happened in the past. And when you have an extraordinary circumstance for which there 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 isn't great uh, historical uh, uh, precedent that becomes less useful so 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 everything remains a big question mark to me I'm, I'm intensely agnostic about everything um for that reason but i mean you know if i'm a dem consultant i would tell them that they should be worried about that for sure well prem uh you're an actual young person uh ken and i just kind of know some young people some of our best <laughs> friends are young people so formerly young long, people. yeah not, and what we were once young people <laughs> believe it or not uh, what what are you hearing from from the youths about this question? So live from the youths, I think most people obviously I think are embracing just the fact that it's complicated. Um, I think many many young. You mean people... the question the question of sitting it out or? Yes, 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 yes. I think as much as you know, certain consultants and and pundits may chide them that how could you even consider it when things would be worse under Trump. Um, I think they're very clearly, evidently aware of that challenge. Um, but I think one thing that they're running up against is that, you know, in the past, many young people, many Democratic based voters generally have been, become accustomed to the idea that, you know, the party will not always respect every wish they have, even and sometimes, especially if it happens to be very widely held belief, whether on marijuana, climate change, so on, student debt. But regardless, they, they become used to that idea and that, you know, they'll come home either way. Um, but I think one thing that's offended a lot of young people, um, or at least kind of made them question the, the idea of sitting out or, or voting third party um, or writing in someone is the fact that they seem to feel that they're not even being dignified. Of course, one aspect of this that we just saw was two days ago on the 100 day statement from the Biden administration, um, of course, rightfully expressing concern for the hostages, um, but not even saying the word Palestine or Palestinians in their statement, things like that, where it doesn't even seem a sort of like our hands are tied. It's like the world is complicated. This is a complicated issue kind of stance. It just feels very much that the Biden administration administration has chosen um, a course of action, um, one that is diametrically opposed to a lot of these young people's um, views of how things should happen. Um, and it doesn't even seem like they're pretending to to care about the fact that there's a disconnect. And I think that's causing a lot of young people to feel that this is different than 
previous times where it's we're choosing between the lesser of two evils. This feels much more like an affront to their basic um, way of experiencing the world. Like this is all happening and they feel essentially gaslit in, in a way. And I think that's making it a lot more complicated. But again, a lot can happen. Similarly, I think Ken is right to be agnostic on making any particular predictions. But I do think this is very different than previous times where Democrats could just rely on the base voters coming home. I think it is very different. Yeah, and what I can gather from the White House uh, is that they do seem confident that you know this this will eventually end, and they will be forgiven. And like you said, they they will they will come back home. Um, it's not obvious how exactly this ends. Uh, it, it, obviously, it can't go on forever. But when previous bombing campaigns you know have ended, whether 2021, 2014, you know, short one in 2022 you'd have you know hundreds sometimes thousands of uh people killed you'd have you know multiple residential and office buildings um destroyed uh, this time you're going to have something like 70 percent of the homes destroyed and the infrastructure you know knocked back to zero uh and tens of thousands you know if we're lucky at this point killed could end up being hundreds of thousands and so even from the moment it ends, the suffering doesn't end, the disease doesn't end, uh, and there will be, have to be years and years of, of reconstruction. So it, we're in, now in January, uh, you know, it could still be an absolute, you know, apocalyptic crisis in November. So that there wouldn't then be time for people uh, to forget because it would still be an ongoing, ongoing crisis. Um, that. Did anybody ask about RFK? Because if not, I, I wanted to get your take on on what role he might end up playing. Because he's I, I didn't see any about RFK Jr. It, it was I was thinking the other day that the the parallels to 1968 have already been brought up. Um, that LBJ uh, was was you know a quite popular president when it came to his domestic policy, uh, the agenda that he was able to enact: Medicare, Medicaid, Civil Rights Act, Fair Housing. Um, and a uh, Voting Rights Act, yet and yet because of the war, he basically was driven out of the the race and decided not to run uh, for re-election. And in came RFK Senior as kind of an anti-war candidate. An alternate war universe in which uh, RFK Junior was either anti-war or at least not aggressively pro-war. You know, might be shaking out differently because there a lot of these independents um, who are all over the place politically do have a kind of isolationist streak to them, and so I th and and I think he'd be doing even even better uh, than he is. Yet he's still polling just based on I think his name recognition and kind of contempt for and disgust of like the choices on offer. Um, so how do you guys feel like he would be? How, how what role will he play in the final analysis and what role do you think he would be playing if he were taking say a trumpian position at this point on israel palestine which is just to say nothing rather than to you know ask if he'd be even worse than biden i see him as symptomatic of people's uh dissatisfaction um you know when he does has these crazy uh gaffes and uh, i don't know if you guys saw on political i was really shocked by this on mlk day so uh political called him up and asked him what his position was on um uh you know his his father robert kennedy's um uh, authorizing of the fbi to wiretap oh, um people around mlk and he said oh yeah it was, he had to do it because he had to the politically it was the reality and 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 actually he was trying to prove that they were innocent and maybe he was going undercover kind of thing and it was just like why is he but it's kind of besides the point it's not about who he is. It's about who he's hoisting the finger at or who he's not. You know what I mean? Uh, and and so, so you know, we have uh, um, someone like Biden who, we, I said before, I think the numbers are something like 60% of his own party didn't want to run again. Th that extraordinary figure, I mean, obviously presidents lose popularity over time. There's a normal kind of half-life um, to administrations. Uh, but but that is a higher degree than, you know, what we saw for Obama and, and his predecessors. So, you know, I think that there's probably a, uh, direct relationship between um, that dissatisfaction and wanting to find someone, anyone who's going to, um, you know, represent some kind of an opposition. Now, you know, I don't 
think he has any kind of um, saliency of himself, but that tells you something about people's uh, dissatisfaction with, as Ryan said, what is on offer? And I think it's a very ominous um, sign. Again, not that he's going to win, but, but, but that um, there is some kind of demand for something else. And Prem, there was, uh, the, Casey found the question uh, somebody, uh, Sean Griffith had asked, um, are there any lessons from the caucus about voter sentiment that might shed light on RFK Jr.'s chances in the general election? To me, the low turnout, uh, although it's 10 degrees below, so it's hard to draw too much, too much from that, uh, could be suggestive of that. Um, but what, what's, your, what's your read uh, in general uh, about the RFK Jr. phenomenon? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think that for one, the turnout, I think is is important. Of course, you know, it might have just been an enthusiasm gap. It might have been the holiday, although you'd think more people would go to vote, could have been the snow. But 14%, as in it was about 100,000 something Republicans out of 700,000 in the state, um, in ostensibly a primary where people would be fired up to vote for Trump um, or to vote against him. Um, but it seems like that wasn't the case. Um, and Sorry, I just got an update message on my computer. Very convenient timing. Um, I think that doesn't necessarily show confidence um, for the the right side of the ticket. I I think I pretty much agree largely with Ken that he he his campaign seems more symptomatic rather than necessarily emblematic of particular enthusiasm. Um, because on one hand, and this could be read two ways, it's hard to necessarily pin down who exactly the RFK voter is um or, or to say who his base is which again could be a good thing because it's kind of all over the place but on the other hand it's hard to say what would mobilize that in an affirmative way that sort of carries him beyond a sort of 15 to 20 percent dissatisfaction vote um so i think that's my that's I, I kind of agree with ken on that broadly speaking about his candidacy uh and here, here's a hard one and and uh we could get out of it by uh, citing our 501c3 nonprofit status, um, which doesn't, which which means that we don't take kind of electoral, you know, direct electoral positions. Um, but Nancy Sullivan of Ohio asked, um, what you know, do do you have advice for semi Democrats who would never vote for any of the R candidates, but who are also furious with Biden over Gaza, among other things? Uh, the one actually, now this is this doesn't help Nancy, who's in Ohio. But if you're in New Hampshire, there's there's a push among new, uh, Democrats and independents um, to vote in the New Hampshire primary and vote and write in ceasefire um, rather than any of the candidates um, and rather than just punching the, the ballot for Biden, that if you if you could get that to catch on uh, and you could actually have ceasefire beat Biden in New Hampshire, obviously ceasefire can't be president. Uh, and the New Hampshire primary isn't even recognized. It's kind of complicated uh, DNC politics uh, where they you know, made South Carolina the first official one. Um, but there is a, a, a groundswell movement um, encouraging people to just uh, write in ceasefire. Um, I, I have always thought about voting not as a moral act, not as an ethical act, but as a, a means to an end. Um, when it comes to your political and civic engagement, I've always thought voting shouldn't even be the most important thing you do, like on the day that you cast the ballot, and that people spend um, way too much time uh, wallowing in misery thinking about their their one vote every four years. Now, of course, there's midterms and other things um, because there's so much else to do in in politics. Uh, with this assault on uh, this wholesale slaughter going on in Gaza, it's it's maybe it's made me question that because I, I understand from I understand when people say that they they don't want to put their they don't they don't want to feel like they're remotely endorsing that even though um, anytime you voted for any president of an imperial core you have you have voted for and endorsed you know some horrific things. Um, there's something about, I guess, just seeing this every day on your feed in front of you, um, knowing knowing people involved in it, uh, knowing that it is preventable and not being prevented, uh, that that raises these that raises the question to to an eth to an ethical one. I I don't have any good advice though, um, and so I'll I'll point to our 501c3 status um, and say that I can't I can't give any any of that advice. Um, but I don't know, Ken, uh, Ken or Prem, how how have you been thinking about this question? 
Well, I've like um, been immunized to uh, feelings after uh, reporting so much on Saudi Arabia as I have, and then going and standing at the gas station and pumping my car full of uh, you know Sa Saudi crude, thinking you know this is the world in which we live, and I'm a participant in things that I don't want to be, and that's just kind of how it goes. It's, that's roughly how I view politics too, is it's filling up your car. But I mean, I wouldn't presume to tell anyone, certainly not you, uh, how to feel about something that, you know, you have every right to be horrified by. Um, that's just my personal yeah. code, I suppose. Yeah, I'd agree with all of that. And I think one thing that I think to Ryan's point, that's been, I think, helpful in discussing with, with peers who have also been kind of dealing with this question is, is remembering that politics is much more, as Ryan has said, than just how we vote every four years, every two years. Um, it's, it's our day-to-day -day lives. It's how we treat other people. It's how it's the things we spend our time doing. It's the way we choose to carry ourselves and 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 the communities we live in. Um, and sometimes that's just a salve um, to to Ken's point of, of the broader sort of um, complicated, um, unethical parts of society that we think we we comprise of. But part of it is just true that that um, politics is is a lot more abundant than it is scarce. So I think. I, again, will probably not advise people how to vote one way or another, but I think that sort of attitude and philosophy, I think, is, is helpful just, you know, selfishly speaking, but I think also does materially have some sort of impact um, wherever you are and, and whatever form that that can be. But it that has been helpful, I think, um, and, and broadens how you see politics, too. Uh, we have time for I think, a couple more. Uh, uh, Grant Wilson um, asks... Uh, multi-part question, Grant. Uh, if Trump wins the primary but loses the general, what is the next iteration of the Republican Party? Does Trump or his acolytes have enough inertia for four more years? Does a more palatable version of Nikki Haley rise up and take back the reins? Or do the Mitt Romney and Joe Manchin types officially break with their respective parties to form the new GOP and push MAGA out into the cold? Either of you guys want to take that? Well, I view it kind of like, say, Apple Computers goes out of business, and um, you know, is there going to be does the is there going to be something like the iPhone? I would guess, yeah, because there's still demand for that kind of a thing, you know, like high end device that blah blah blah. And in the case of Trump, there's so much focus on the, uh, I guess maybe the, I can call it the supply side of the economic equation. These politicians, they people don't appreciate as much. What someone like Trump comes along because there's demand for something like that on the part of the base and on the part of the public. So I imagine that maybe that that will fluctuate. Maybe there'll be less demand for that after they see that he's, uh, you know, in your hypothetical defeated at the ballot. But I have to imagine it doesn't go to zero. So whatever forces caused something like the groundswell support for uh, it, not just his first candidacy, but this the second one after having been defeated, I have to imagine that that there will be some residue of that. And so it's someone like Trump will, will then come along to try to capitalize on that. I, that to me, that seems... Um, um, axiomatic, uh, but but I think that uh, there would be no shortage of uh, members of the intelligentsia saying, "Oh, great, nothing to worry about. Everything's done. Now we can go back to our wonderful, you know, uh, neoliberal consensus of, of Bush v. Gore kind of thing, where they agree on a lot of things. So we don't have to worry about this kind of stuff anymore." But yeah, I just I think that's a pretty short-sighted view. I would also add that I mean, of course, it's just been one caucus so far, and again, the turnout was quite low, but just from the results we have, of course, I think there's two ways of looking at it. One, it's Trump versus non-Trump votes. So you could say, oh, 49% of the, the voters wanted someone else. And that's surely one way of looking at it that I think is, is helpful. But another frame is that if you think of it as MAGA and MAGA adjacent politics versus non-MAGA. And in, in that instance, you have 51% Trump, you have 20, 21.2% DeSantis, 8% Vivek. And then 19% for Haley. And, and that kind of reframes the demands, demand side, as Ken said, for, for this kind of thing. And I think reminds you that, sure, there might be some people that are maybe tired of Trump and his tweets, or, you know, he could be a little, you know, less brash or whatever. Or, or maybe they just genuinely somehow, some way find Ron DeSantis to be charming. Um, but regardless, that there there still seems to be this this appetite for it. And and one other thing to keep in mind is, let's say Trump loses in twenty twenty four. Unless 
um, his pile of indictments um, and and all the crimes that he has committed catch up to him materially, which which they could, which they could. He could run again. There's not necessarily yes. stopping him from yeah. running in 2028. And I don't <laughs> want to leave you all with that um, thought, but that is, that, that is something to keep in mind, whether even if he's not blessing Vivek to run in, in whatever, four years, he could just run again himself. He's, he's pretty darn healthy, relatively speaking. Um, and as we've seen, age does not necessarily stop these people from continuing to run. So that's that's something to keep in mind, too. He's the only president, certainly in living memory, um, that seemed to grow younger in office. And I think it has to be his like uniquely powerful narcissistic personality that like being the center of global attention for four years was just a life force for him. He needs it. Uh, it, it keeps him young. You look at pictures when Obama was elected, when he left, when George W. Bush was elected, when he left, when Reagan, uh, left as a vegetable. Um, even Biden over just a couple of years has like aged in, in front of our eyes. Uh, across the board, you see the pressures of the presidency weighing on people. Uh, whereas when it comes to Trump, it, it goes the opposite direction. So you you could certainly imagine a world uh, in which he runs again in 2028 because running is attention as well. Like even, even like this, if he says he's not, if he loses 2024 uh, and then announces that he's not going to run again in 2028, then it's much harder for him to gin up the attention that he that he needs, uh, and so I, he will dangle it the entire time if he's if he doesn't win, and then he would make a decision in you know after the midterms of twenty twenty six I guess um, if he's going to go for it. So I think that's a very real possibility. Um, so yeah, uh, interesting. Uh, we'll see. I think we have we have time for one more here. Um, VP. Uh, VP candidate for Donald Trump. So if Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis are, are not considered for VP, um, have you considered other potential candidates for the position? I think RFK Jr. would be hilarious. Um, and if so, how do you think that potential alternative could affect the 2024 campaigning of Trump? Um, either you guys have uh, Vive Stakes thoughts um, for the orange man. And the first, oh, my insights are probably not very um, illuminating. Um, I'd be curious to see if he's able to let uh, uh, let bygones be bygones, which of course is not what Trump ever does. But um, have some kind of, uh, uh, I mean, you know, this this idea of y uniting the party around some kind of more, um, I don't know, uh, figure more amenable to the to the old guard of the party. Which could be beneficial to him, but which it's just hard for me to imagine ever, him ever doing that after feeling betrayed by by um, not not essentially having a uh, a, uh, a coronation, um, or if it'll just be a total uh, dark horse out of nowhere. Um, and I mean, you know, I just don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't know enough to say either way. I think he, the Roger Stone in him, would love to do an RFK Jr. Um, I bet he is annoyed at uh, RFK Jr.'s voice and doesn't want to hear that voice around him. You know, he's got that vocal cord problem. Um, I think Tim Scott checks all the boxes that, that you were just talking about. And Tim Scott was quite um, uh, was quite pliant and complimentary toward Trump during his very brief and forgettable presidential campaign. Um, uh, Trump is extremely self-satisfied about the, his increasing support among uh, black voters. And so, you know, you could imagine in his mind thinking, well, if I pick Tim Scott, I'll I'll pick up even even more of that. I don't know, Prem. You have any quick thoughts on that? Because I know Casey's got a couple of things he he wanted to add in a moment. Yeah, I would just say that um, I think logically he probably should pick Nikki Haley um, because she you know checks off all those boxes. Um, I, but I think, and I I also think that even though he is kind of a diva about certain things, I actually don't think he holds that many grudges um, overall when it comes to like. Right accepting and giving endorsements he's pretty fluid with that kind of thing um i think but even I, with even with hillary clinton it, there was this wild moment that people kind of missed after he was elected president uh he was at a rally and they started chanting lock her up and he's like he, and he was like stop 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 
guys, that was for the campaign. Come on. We're not, we're not, we're not actually going to do that. Like the biggest, you know, uh, the biggest damage we could do to her was to beat her. And we did that. So yeah. come on, move on. We're not, we're not really locking her up. <laughs> but I think Tim honestly would make a lot of sense because it seems like, and of course we have a very small sample size, but Mike Pence was kind of this just slate, you know, he, he, he wasn't actually any threat to Trump in any way electorally or otherwise. And of course, Trump, if he wins, he wouldn't run again, but, or presumably wouldn't be able to, but who knows, I guess, with Project 2025. But despite him not being able to run again, I think just he likes the idea of, of just sort of a, a blank kind of person by his side, like Mike Pence, uh, like what he had with 1% in the polls tops. Um, and Tim Scott, like I think similarly, as we've seen, doesn't really have the presidential electoral juice thus far, at least for his party. Um, so I think, you know, if it's not Haley or DeSantis, I actually could see um, Tim Scott being a pretty, pretty high up there option. I'll yeah. say this, in his choice of Pence, who just, when he was first came on the scene, was just very, seemed uh, low key and quiet. And then you'll notice a lot of his appointments to top positions. Do you remember his complaint about Comey? The worst thing he could do, he was a showboat. He's drawing attention away from me. Exactly. So I exactly. wonder if a way to, I wonder if a predictive um, uh a tool we could use here is to think about who's not gonna who, who he won't feel will outshine him you know yeah. it's a very quiet low, low key person <laughs> Tim yeah. Scott, i think i think tim scott fits that and prem, prem raises an interesting point that i just wanted to finish on uh i one reason that i don't think donald trump becomes a a, a dictator as he said he wants to be dictator for a day uh is is that he is term limited out and in order to in order to get those term limits changed, you wouldn't let's say let's say you don't need a constitutional amendment because the Supreme Court can just you know announce what it says the Constitution says, and could issue a ruling that would allow uh, him to stay for life. Let's say like that that has happened in a lot of democracies where Supreme Courts either uh, lift term limits or allow allow somebody to stay. Uh, you would need two things for that. You would need a pliant Supreme Court. And I don't think that the the Roberts court um, wants Donald Trump to stay in office. Like I think that Roberts and the others see Trump as very useful for their project, but also a wild card um, and kind of a danger to their long term project. And so, you know, they'll they'll they would want to see him go. The other thing you would need would basically be the military to enforce uh, th that. And the military is not with Trump. And and I don't think there's any amount of twenty twenty five project that that can you know successfully root out the the civilian military distinction um, that is so embedded into the culture of our our military that may end up you know you, you can laugh at me if i'm in prison you know five years from now um but i i don't think that's naive i think that's a that's a more realistic and um uh kind of less sensational way of of looking at it what wh where do you guys fit on Oh, on I that, couldn't. On that I couldn't agree more with you. Just because, from the perspective of national security and seeing how he conducted those four years in office, even with the crazy things he wanted to do, this guy is the opposite of a bureaucracy wrangler that you need to be to be able to effectuate. These are not simple systems. You know, it's not a movie where you just snap your fingers and then they go and run and implement it. You've got to know where the pressure points are within DOD. You know how to. You have to know how to squeeze people like um, uh, Mattis, who is thinking of his own legacy and how he doesn't want to carry out certain things. That's not. You know, as Reagan said, uh, uh, you know, personnel is policy, like how you go about uh, uh, running the bureaucracy is extremely important. And that's something that I think Trump is uniquely weak. I mean, as talented right. as a campaigner as he is, you know, he's not he's just not an organized. Yeah. And he, guy and he also loves he loves drama and he loves to bring in people like Bolton that he disagrees with to watch them kind of fight with the people that he does agree with. Just look just for the drama but what that also does is it makes it more difficult for you to then have kind of a unified uh capacity to basically you know completely take over totally. the, the, the career apparatus of, the, of yeah. the government um anyway uh this has been a lot of fun thank you guys for your for your questions thank thank you all for joining um we, we'd like to continue doing more of these uh we also want to continue doing uh the journalism that that we're doing uh, it's it's expensive uh, sending people uh, around the country, digging through documents, um, fending off lawsuits, which we're, we're, we're very good at both drawing lawsuits and defeating lawsuits. Uh, but 
uh, the, it's it's costly um, along the way. And so, you know, your support is the, is the thing that makes that possible. And if you like doing these, then, you know, donate in the, you know, to the link that uh, Casey put in the chat, because, hey, the more donations we get out of doing these, then the more we'll be able to um, tell Celine and Casey, Let, let's, let's do those more often. Yeah, those, those are fun. And we'd also like to figure out ways to kind of get, get you guys to pop into the conversation as well beyond just, you know, submitting questions. I think it'd be fun to um, chat face to face this is the we're you know we're thinking we're thinking through how you know how we can how we can make these work um uh but your financial support is what you know un underlies all of it a a am i right or am i wrong uh ken and prem oh no totally it's a very resource intensive line of i mean i don't know if prem in his career tried freelancing i did and <laughs> what it meant was that you, you can't do very ambitious projects because there's all of these associated costs not just in terms of the investigation but even legal exposure after the fact I mean, it's it's so. I mean, you know, it's sort of like the metaphor of the iceberg. What you see in the story, that's like a very small part of what happens when you when you write it. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's exactly right. Um, well, anyway, uh, thank you again. Thank you, Casey and Celine, for and and Kate and everybody for helping to organize this. And we'll see you again uh, sometime soon. Thanks, guys. Take care.